my own intersection with last week's problem was when I received at about 7.30 in the morning an iMessage from Sue, my bookkeeper. She had been away from the office for about a week traveling with her laptop and, you know, checking in constantly uh, to, to deal with any sales.grc uh, related mail stuff. And she sent me a note saying that Eudora, yes, we're, we're all still using Eudora, uh, was returning grc.com address not resolved error. And, and I thought, well, that's odd. And so I shot her a text note back and said, well, okay, that doesn't really sound like our problem, um, but I'll look into it. And then like maybe two hours later, I got an alert saying that an, one of the GRC's e-commerce transactions had failed. And I do, if, if, if the GRC server is unable to connect to our merchant gateway through which we, we process uh, customer credit card transactions, uh, it waits uh, like a few seconds and tries again. So it does 10 retries and then declares a failure and then returns a response to the user through the web page that something outside of our control is preventing us from successfully completing the, the, the charge. You know, it's not you got the zip code wrong or your, your street address doesn't match. It's, so, it's something else. So that, that happened. So someone was determined to buy a copy of Spinrite. So I had to listen to 30 individual sets of or three sets of 10 so 30 total error messages i it, it generates this the star trek hailing whistle and then a voice says uh something about <laughs> exactly uh, e-commerce transaction retry and then does that 10 times and then e-commerce transaction failure so i always know what's going on so then i started seeing the news about a dns related outage and that, of course, put all the pieces together for me. That explained why Sue, wherever she was, she was at down like in Texas or somewhere, where for whatever DNS server her location was using was unable to obtain the IP for GRC. And suddenly I thought, ah, I'll bet you that that's what's happening because of the, the coincidence that GRC's e-commerce system was unable to obtain through DNS lookup, the IP for the merchant gateway. But I was able to get it from here as, as a Cox subscriber. So I looked up the IP, uh, jumped over to GRC's server, and dropped an entry into the hosts file. And as we all know, the hosts file, even today, is, and this is on a Windows 2008 R2 server, so a, a recent server, uh, it looks in the host's file first. Well, what I found, interestingly, was I had already commented out the line I was going to put in. In other words, this had happened previously. So all I did was I removed the pound sign from the front of that line because the IP had not changed from whenever it was I had done that before. And then immediately uh, e-commerce transactions started to process again. So, so we had a big DNS problem. And of course, everybody knows about last week's massive outage. Now, uh, I think what surprised people though was, well, several things. Our listeners know enough to wonder why DNS caching didn't mask the problem. And I will explain why that is. But um, essentially, there was a company uh, based on the East Coast, Dyne, that is the authoritative name server for, as we learned, many major providers, meaning that that that, that service – and, I mean, Dyne is a major DNS provider. So are These, they one of the 13 or are they a, a subsidiary to the, the main phone books? Uh, so yeah, they're not the root servers. Root servers, yeah. They, they 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 would, for example, be the they would they offer the servers that a, a d that a domain registrar points to. So for example, you know, if you look up 
that Twitter.com's registrar, that whoever they're using, you know, very much the way, for example, I'm using Hover right now. So at for, for the domains I have at Hover, uh, I've given them the, the level three servers that GRC uses. And so those are the authoritative domain name servers for GRC. That is, though that that's where GRC.com's DNS records are. And so it turns out that many of these large companies have outsourced their DNS. You know, being me, I, of course, I don't. I do my own. And in fact, I, I actually have the root server and level threes are slaves. So so that they actually handle all of the traffic, but they obtain the what, what's known as the, the GRC.com zone record from, from my master server, which is a, a free BSD Unix machine. So, so these major companies just thought, you know, there's no value to be added by DNS. And they also wanted, you know, they I mean they're much larger than GRC. I'm fine having two strong level three DNS servers serve GRC's DNS. But, you know, Twitter and Amazon AWS and, you know, huge, huge internet presences, they really need multiple physical presences, you know, multiple points of presence. So West Coast, East Coast, international and so forth, so that so that the, the world's DNS queries are not all just pounding on one or two servers, but are being distributed by essentially a, the equivalent of a content distribution network for name services. And that's what Dyn offers. Um, the problem so if I'm is, using Hover, uh, the, I, I didn't go down because correct. I was using what they chose, but you are doing your own. Correct. Got it. And so, yeah, so you, so you, you could use Hover's DNS – or as I do, I could point my hover registration record at level three's DNS. And instead, they, like Twitter, has pointed their their registrations record at Dyn's DNS servers. Oh, in, in, so it's because you were using level three that you got hit. Uh, no, it's actually that um, uh, whoever... Well, for example, my merchant account uh, company was using Dyn. So your also GRC wasn't down. Correct. But you couldn't take a credit card. Correct. Got it. And wherever Sue was, her her DNS provider was somehow affected by this too. So 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 anyway, it was it, it was a a, a wake up call yeah. that so many major sites were. Could, could be taken down by by an attack on one part of the infrastructure. And, you know, we've often talked about, because we've talked about DNS often, it is UDP protocol, which is meant to be lightweight. And, and what that means is that it is inherently spoofable. TCP connections cannot be spoofed because you need that three-way handshake. Packets have to be have to be able to make a successful round trip from each endpoint to the other and back in order for a TCP connection to be to essentially to be completed and connected. But that that's an overhead that simple lookup services minimize so they simply just send off a, a an unverified UDP packet towards its destination and if they get a response that's great it was very quick and inexpensive if they don't they wait a minute and well not a minute but a few seconds and then they try again so they take responsibility for trying to get a, a response but what that also means is that for example they're able to deliberately rewrite the outgoing packet's apparent source IP to mask their actual source IP. And if those, if those illegitimate source IPs are allowed out onto the Internet, and that's you know, uh, something we've talked about often, this whole, the whole issue of, of egress filtering, where ISPs currently do allow packets that cannot have a, I mean, who, whose packets clearly 
are known, could be known to the ISP to be falsifying their return address, essentially, their source IP. All the ISPs know if packets are leaving that could never pack, if they're an illegitimate source IP, they arguably should be dropped on site. They should just simply be ignored. But that's not happening today. Um, so there is actually, uh, there is a an RFC and a, a, a proposal, BCP38, and the RFC is 2827, uh, which is titled Network Ingress Filtering, Defeating Denial of Service Attacks, which employ IP source address spoofing. And there's even an acronym for a movement that is trying to get itself going called SAVE, which is Source Address Validation Everywhere. The, the the implication being there there are there are even choke points where you know and I've talked about this too a a, a router in the middle of the internet has a routing table that tells it which connections to send packets to based on where they're going but that can also infer which connections packets can have come from and so even even routers in arbitrary locations could be made smarter and to recognize packets which cannot be valid. But again, nobody's doing that. So, and as, as we talked about this last week, it was funny because you and I were talking about IoT and, and about source address spoofing. And I mentioned that unfortunately there were other attacks that did not rely on on spoofed source addresses and so those would pass right through such filters and and in fact the attacks last week did not re re rely on whether they spoofed their source addresses or not and they may have because they were dns attacks um but they didn't need to um okay so dine wrote something sort of a you know a, a not saying very much corporate level speak uh they they, they uh, un, in their blog posting under what we know they said at this point we know this was a sophisticated highly distributed attack involving tens of millions of ip addresses we are conducting a thorough root cause and forensic analysis and we'll report what we know in a responsible fashion the nature and source of the attack is under investigation, but it was a sophisticated attack across multiple attack vectors and internet locations. We can confirm with the help of analysis from Flashpoint and Akamai that one source of the traffic of, of one source of the traffic for the attacks were devices infected by the Mirai botnet. We observed tens of millions of discrete IP addresses, now, assuming those were not spoofed, because of course, if they're just pseudo random, then they could easily be not, not tens of millions, but you know, 10 pretending to be more. But we now know that this, you know, that that is, that this is a huge botnet. 